Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the 2023 State of the University Address. Thanks to everyone who's here in person. It's nice of you to come, and also to the hundreds of people who are watching online. Uh, a few special welcomes. I'd like to give a special welcome to the members of the Granite State College community who are joining the UNH family this year. Also, greetings to everyone at Franklin Pierce School of Law and UNH Manchester who have gathered together to watch the talk. And I also want to give a special shout outs to my friends, the ROTC cadets who have come over to join us today. So welcome. Good to have you all. As I begin my formal remarks, I'd like to start with a short video that shows some of our highlights from the year 2022. And it is a remarkable tribute to our community. So let's start with that. So I'd like to thank everyone who contributed to that video, either because you were in it, because you did something great, or all the people who put it together, and also my opportunity to thank everyone who helped with the logistics for this speech, which are considerable, but also to the entire UNH community for all of the accomplishments that are portrayed in that video. I am consistently inspired by your dedication and by your contributions to the university and to the great state of New Hampshire. Traditionally, the State of the University Address is where we look back on the past year, continue, consider the present, and share our plans for future success. But today, I'd like to look back a bit further to our birth and to our original mission and purpose as an institution. When UNH was founded in 1866, our mission was to offer education in agriculture and the mechanical arts to serve our state. In fact, our original name, as many of you will know, was the New Hampshire College of Agriculture and the Mechanical Arts. And this was consistent with the purpose of the Morrill Act, which established the nation's federal land-grant college system. And then, 100 years ago, we became the University of New Hampshire. And it's interesting to look back 100 years and to consider how far we've come. I think we have some, some photos of those days. So as you know, the university has always put a premium on efficiency and value. So this is from 1923, the year we became the University of New Hampshire, and it appears that we could not afford to form the letter U. We only had <laughs> funding for the N and the H. Although, in, in previewing this photo, this is the one I love. What are you going to do today? Well, I'm going to be the point one. <laughs> Although our founding mission remained, the state law that recognized us as a university added a clause stating that we would, quote, prosecute such researches as may be necessary and desirable in the education of youth and the advancement and the development of the art, the sciences, and the industries. And I want to immediately note that prosecute such researches means to carry out research. <laughs> Nobody actually wanted to prosecute researchers, at least as far as I know. But what did it mean to officially recognize research as part of our mission and to expand the scope of our education more broadly in the sciences and the arts? In short, it was an enhancement of our calling. It meant that we made a deeper, broader, and more enduring commitment to expanding the excellence of our undergraduate and our graduate education. It allowed us to fully embrace a diverse and growing number of disciplines. 
and it allowed us to pursue the highest levels of excellence in our research and in the quality of the faculty and staff whom we attracted. It challenged us to create new and innovative solutions to the biggest challenges facing New Hampshire as well as the nation and indeed the world. Our mission as a university, I believe, has served us well ever since. It has guided us and united us through eras of tremendous turmoil and change. The Great Depression, several recessions, two world wars, and sadly, many other conflicts as well. The vital and as yet unfinished fight for civil rights, equality, and justice. And more recently, and you knew this was coming, the COVID-19 pandemic. Although we're not out of the woods yet, our successful response reflects the proud tradition of innovation and compassion across our community. As 2023 begins, UNH and indeed all of the nation's higher education institutions are confronting unprecedented and even existential challenges, headwinds that are causing many to question the relevance, value, and sustainability of higher education institutions. I wouldn't imagine that any of these challenges are new to you. From a demographic standpoint, the nation's college-going population is expected to drop by roughly 15% between 2025 and 2029. And as you probably know, the Northeast will be among the hardest hit regions. Other challenges include increased competition and alternative paths to a degree, the impact of high inflation on the budget of families, businesses, and us, and institutions like ours. And then also, more specifically, challenges to international enrollment, certainly caused by COVID, but also exacerbated by changes in US visa policy. All of these represent significant challenges to us as we continue to pursue our mission and strategic priorities. And yet, and yet I'm filled with tremendous confidence and faith in our community, in you. And I continue to be excited about the bright future that we are in fact creating together. And today, you'll hear about some of the very powerful work that we're pursuing across our university. The planning that we did as a community several years ago has given us a clear and enduring blueprint to drive our success. In 2019, the UNH community convened across our campuses to help prepare for the headwinds that were gathering on our horizon. This was one of the most inspiring community-wide efforts that I've ever been a part of, and it showed what an exceptional university this is. The result of our efforts was the future of UNH strategic plan rooted in our university's founding mission and it focuses our efforts in four priority areas. Each priority area has an aspiration, a hope, a vision, along with detailed initiatives which you can find on the future of UNH website. In the interest of time, I'm not going to read all the aspirations but they'll appear on the screen here behind me and I'll share a few of the initiatives and accomplishments under each. We will begin with the Embrace New Hampshire priority, which is our commitment to the Granite State. And I'll illustrate this priority with a video that shows some of the remarkable UNH partners and projects that several UNH leaders visited during a two-day bus tour of New Hampshire last fall. In all, we made nine stops from the Great Bay, literally from the Great Bay. We were in, well, on top of the Great Bay on a boat which seems seaworthy. We were in the Great Bay on a boat, then we went to Rochester, then north of the Notches. You know I've been in New Hampshire a long time if I know to say Notches, plural, right? Okay. North of the Notches to Gorham and Littleton, and finally south to the Lakes region and Concord. It was an extraordinary opportunity to better understand how deeply UNH supports our state and to meet the people who work with us in partnership to embrace New Hampshire. So let's see that video. The Embrace New Hampshire tour was a wonderful opportunity for senior administrators as well as faculty and students to get out and get across the state of New Hampshire. Probably what stood out the most is how the diverse elements of UNH have been involved in so many different areas of the state, in cities and towns and hospitals and businesses and farms, both on the ground and in the water. I think it was an amazing opportunity to connect the folks around the state that engage with parts of UNH, whether it be students, cooperative extension, researchers, or alumni, and have them have an opportunity to engage with the current leader of the university. That matters. In, in a small state like New Hampshire, it really matters. 
for leadership to get out there and hear real stories about real ways that we're already working across the state, but also hear about problems that we may not be aware of. That's really the way that we embrace New Hampshire, is to have that back and forth relationship with the people that we need to engage with. We do a lot of work with UNH in terms of research. It's very important to us that the water quality is good in the Bay and the health of the Bay is really important to our product. And I think it was so important for, for everybody to come up today because look at what we've done. And it started because the extension said, hey, why don't we come in, we'll take a look, let's see what we can do to help you, let's lay some groundwork, and then take it from there. And we were able to do that. Recruiting has been extremely challenging in the North Country for a number of years, uh, and that has been even more challenging since COVID. Housing is difficult. Once we get the students here and they see the clinically rich environment that they can practice in, we've been successful in recruiting from the UNH students. We enlisted the help of Extension to help us what's going to work, what isn't going to work, and it has just expanded from there, from everything from the horticultural end of things, how to grow crops, what to grow, when you have a problem, to pest management, to even the business aspects of it. The Embrace New Hampshire tour was a fantastic experience for me. I think it's really important to get out in the state. A common theme at each stop was that they had already been working with UNH in different ways. And what we were doing was we were listening to them tell the story of their success. And we were learning about the next places where UNH and our faculty, staff, and students can help play a role I thought the trip was incredible and if we really want to live up to embrace New Hampshire, we have to do this more than once a year. I would say overall I, I thought the trip was fantastic and we were just really happy to be out there and, and meeting all those folks and being able to celebrate what UNH means to the state of New Hampshire. So fun fact, we're helping the people on that apple farm grow peaches. Raise your hand if you knew you could grow peaches in New Hampshire. All right, show off. <laughs> okay, wait a minute, I gotta edit the speech in case I give that one again. I love how the tour and the video about the tour reflected the reach of our mission today, education, research, and outreach that we deliver across so many diverse sectors and regions of the Granite State. Our next priority, enhanced student success and well-being, focuses on the entire student experience and our work to support them in becoming healthy, engaged citizens in their communities after they graduate. Last spring, Governor Sununu signed bipartisan legislation that will complete our merger with Granite State College in July of this year. This is an important step forward in our work to increase academic and professional training options for students throughout their lives and it will help us to grow New Hampshire's workforce, particularly in areas of high demand. Graduating from UNH into a great career is a clear measure of success, and I'm proud to say that an increasing number of employers are coming to UNH to recruit our students. In fact, 94% of our recent graduates are working in public service or pursuing advanced degrees shortly after they graduate, and I will say that's quite a bit above the national average, so a lot to be proud of there. Here's a brief video that shows how our Career and Professional Success Office works with partners across New Hampshire to hire UNH students. At the University of New Hampshire, we're developing a workforce that meets the needs of the state's communities and advances New Hampshire's economy. The state's got a workforce shortages in a variety of areas, but there's no doubt healthcare is first and foremost. We not only prepare students with our world-class facilities and expert advising on campus, we foster partnerships across the state for training that pays off. Once the UNH students come up, they get exposed to our community and our facility, they fall in love with us. Eversource and UNH work closely together. At this time, we've got three students, one in engineering, one in energy efficiency, and one in data science. So I think it's really important for us to have a connection with higher education, and UNH being one of those. New Hampshire Biomade, funded with a $20 million National Science Foundation grant, is powering a workforce pipeline from the state's community colleges to UNH in support of New Hampshire's growing advanced manufacturing and biomaterials fields. 
these are areas where you definitely need to have a well-trained workforce in order for companies in these areas to have the personnel to successfully run their operations. Biomade opened my eyes to what mechanical engineering could be. UNH's Office of Career and Professional Success, or CAPS, is the nexus of industry and future employees, ensuring our students are prepared to meet the needs of a dynamic workforce. And then I work in Portsmouth part-time at Catch Fire Creative, uh, which is a digital marketing agency, and that's where I'll be working after I graduate. So after UNH, I'll be working at BAE Systems in Nashua. I think UNH has prepared me very well for going into BAE. We believe in partnerships. You know, we are uh, working across the university to get everyone to play a role in the career preparedness of our students. In addition to preparing students for great careers, we also want to ensure our students' overall well-being, which includes certainly their mental health. As you know, the challenges associated with COVID included a tremendous increase in student mental health issues across the country, including here in New Hampshire and at UNH. So we're launching this year a comprehensive support system for student mental health in coordination with Plymouth State University and Keene State College. Our academic and research excellence priority calls on UNH to be recognized globally for our, our outstanding teaching, learning, and research. We have attracted record support and recognition for our research excellence from NASA. Early last year, UNH gained national attention when NASA awarded us $250 million to study turbulence in solar wind and space plasmas. This is our largest grant ever from NASA and it will engage our faculty, students, and staff in the coming years in studying the effects of solar forces on the space around our planet. This past year, we also received a generous gift from YAS Foundation. This will establish the Nosrat Yassini Poetry Festival, a UNH poet in residence position, and a graduate student scholarship in poetry. And it is wonderful to see this kind of support for the humanities. So thank you, Ruth Bay and Pamela, who are responsible for that. And today, it is my honor to announce that Dana Hamill is contributing $20 million to provide additional scholarship funds for the Hamill Scholars and to renovate Huddleston Hall, the new home for the Hamill Scholars and Honors College. Because this astonishing gift greatly benefits our students and enhances the future of New Hampshire, we are pleased to name the Honors College for him and for his family. I recently met with Dana, and it was incredibly moving and inspiring to talk with him about how important his contributions are for UNH and for our state. And so I'd like to share a brief video of Dana sharing his vision for the new Honors College. The purpose of the Hamill Honors and Scholars College is to, number one, allow young people who have shown leadership, have shown ability to get good grades uh, and been involved in the communities, a chance to get a good education. And the second part is over and above that, they will be in a position to be able to be leaders in the communities in which they live and hope many will be, be in New Hampshire, but they'll hope they'll be all over the country and the world. Thank you, Dana. The generosity that you've shown and your family has shown has transformed the lives of thousands of UNH students and will support generations to come. Financial strength is a priority that challenges us to use our resources wisely, sustainably, and with a focus on delivering value to our students and partners. And it's the foundation on which all of our other priorities rest. In 2022, we raised a record $79 million in philanthropy, supported by one of our highest rates of alumni participation in our history. So thank you to our donors and to our advancement team for making that happen. But let me tell you about a couple examples of what these generous donors are actually helping us to make possible. First, for the fifth year in a row, 
we're offering the Granite Guarantee, which provides free in-state tuition to New Hampshire students whose families are eligible for the Pell Grant. This covers roughly 2,000 students who might never have been able to afford to attend college otherwise, something very much to be proud of. And at the recommendation of the university presidents of the system, the USNH Board of Trustees recently voted to freeze in-state tuition for the academic year beginning next fall. This will mark the fifth year in a row that we've frozen in-state tuition. That means that any undergraduate student from New Hampshire who graduates next year will have paid the same tuition over the four years that he or she has been here. I think that is worth clapping for. This past year, we revamped our budget process for the next fiscal year and established a new financial organization for future years. This effort will transform our business systems to a modern enterprise resource planning ERP system. Planning and contracting, of course, has already begun, and we expect the ERP to be fully implemented in 2027. I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions about this. It's a big change. My promise is that we'll collaborate with people across the university and the university system on their key needs. And in fact, this is already happening. We have lots and lots of people working on this already. We'll complete comprehensive system testing and offer detailed training, and we'll keep you posted on our progress. I open the State of the University Address with a look back on our founding mission as a university. Along with our future of UNH strategy, our historic mission continues to inspire remarkable success for UNH and for the State of New Hampshire. We are outperforming expectations in virtually every area, including enrollment, philanthropy, and research. And I encourage you to learn more about our plans at the Future of UNH website. There you can find updates on the key metrics that we're using to show progress toward our goal of being one of the top 25 public universities in the nation on the most important measures of academic performance. I'll just pick one to point out. Our national rank for students participating in internships and other high impact opportunities rose from 36th to 21st over the past year. So yes, in the top 25 of public universities. This is a great confirmation of the results that our strategy is inspiring. And one of the things, that I'm gonna go off script here for a second, one of the things I really love about this is so many people in the university contribute to that outcome. Staff across the university, faculty across the university, people in finance across the university figuring out ways to support these students, deans, other administrators. But many of you are dealing really closely with students and you're making that happen for an individual student and that's how we can get those kinds of results. And so when I say I'm proud of the contributions, these are the kinds of things I'm talking about in the trenches Nobody's seeing it, but you're making great things happen. And that's why I'm so honored to serve you as your president, because of the kind of work that you're doing along those lines. In 2023, we'll continue to deliver remarkable achievements with ongoing and new initiatives that are guided by our strategic pillars. We'll do everything possible to continue to make UNH more affordable for our students, especially those with the greatest financial need. We'll continue to plan for an exciting project to expand our research enterprise workforce development efforts, and business partnerships. The EDGE Research Complex would expand a partially developed commercial site on the western edge of campus. It could also provide room to add housing for graduate students and young professionals. This project has tremendous potential to be one of the most exciting research and job creating initiatives for UNH in many years. And so I'd like to show you one final video to help you envision what the EDGE might look like. From the seafloor to the stars, UNH researchers seek to understand and improve our world by harnessing cutting edge technology and preparing future innovators through high impact educational opportunities. In concert with New Hampshire colleges and universities, business and industry, and state and federal governments, we're preparing a skilled workforce that will drive economic development and competitiveness for the state and the nation. So what's next? To expand our research horizon, we're looking to the edge. The proposed West Edge Innovation Neighborhood. With 500,000 square feet of innovation space adjacent to the Durham campus, the edge will increase economic growth for New Hampshire 
by fostering intensified university business partnerships. We know the demand exists. Current partners such as IX Blue, creators of an autonomous seafloor mapping vehicle, co-developed with our Center for Coastal and Ocean Mapping, has set up shop in the Olson Center, but they'll soon outgrow that space. Other campus partners are eager to expand their footprint in Durham and deepen their engagement with UNH research. Our students, too, will find enhanced opportunities at the edge, working side by side with some of the region's most exciting innovators and entrepreneurs. With amenities like retail, dining, recreation and housing, the edge will support a rich ecosystem of integrated living, learning and discovering. So these are just a few highlights of what our community can and will accomplish together. The Edge Research Park, the Hamill Honors and Scholars College, our ongoing efforts around workforce development, and our continued focus on making UNH more affordable for students are part of a bigger and brighter future for us and for our state. As Dana Hamill has said, New Hampshire's strongest asset is the University of New Hampshire, and I could not agree more. He's also said, and this is from someone who's been probably in the top 1% of successful investors in the country, that his best investment has been in us, and it has. These initiatives, along with many others across our campuses and in our outreach programs, make us stronger as a community. They'll help us to meet and to overcome even the strongest headwinds. Together, we'll build together a great future for UNH in 2023. Just a few final points of pride and some new initiatives. On April 4th this year, our community is celebrating the 30th anniversary of the Pride and Pancake Breakfast, as well as the 50th anniversary of UNH's first gay student organization. I'd also like to remind everyone that February is Black History Month, and you can find a robust schedule of opportunities to participate in the UNH DEI website. In 2022, we also celebrated the 25th anniversary of the Sustainability Institute which was the first endowed program of its kind in the nation. And I'm delighted that we're carrying forward the momentum in 2023 to engage UNH alumni with a new Alumni Sustainability Webinar Series. This series brings together alumni who are experts in sustainability across a wide range of industries and sectors. The next session is, by coincidence, tomorrow, February 15th. These monthly webinars are open to everyone and there's still time to sign up. In Manchester, the reputation of our research and faculty recently helped the city to win a $44 million federal grant to support the development of the biofabrication cluster. This will be a game changer for the city and for Southern New Hampshire, helping it to become a global leader in the biomedical manufacturing industry. It will also create great academic programs, research opportunities, and internships for our students who will be prepared to fill thousands of new jobs in biofab. So, if we could go back in time to 1923 and show the university community, as well as the people of New Hampshire, what UNH is today, I believe that they would be both proud and probably astonished at the breadth, depth, and excellence of our work together. I trust too that they would recognize the thread of the mission that they gave to us in 1923 and see it running boldly through our greatest achievements and 100 years from now, in 2123, when I finish this speech, I believe, <laughs> come on, you were thinking that. I, I believe that the UNH community will look back with pride on how we envisioned and carried out our work through the headwinds of this era. And I believe in my heart that they'll be even more impressed by how we, as a community, have stood together and triumphed. We are all carrying on a proud legacy and a proud tradition. And as you go forward from today, I encourage you to share these ideas from this talk widely, along with our progress on the future of UNH. Celebrate UNH here on campus, in your social media, in your families, in your communities. Let everyone know how proud you are to be part of the University of New Hampshire. Honor and celebrate our history. And let's go forward together toward a bright, bold, and promising future. So thank you, everyone. It's a great day for New Hampshire, and an especially, you know what I'm going to say, great day to be a Wildcat. Thank you.
Thank you so much. So we're going to do a combination on the Q&A of questions that have been submitted online, and many of you may have submitted them, or people who are out there online may have submitted them. And I'm going to take some questions from the audience. But unfortunately, to broach a sad topic, I'm sure you've all read about what happened at Michigan State University yesterday, yet another incident of mass violence, and one that hits maybe a little bit closer to home because it's a university much like ours. So I, I thought that it might be on your mind, what are we doing here? Could this happen here? Um, and yes, it, it certainly could happen anywhere. But I've been back and forth today uh, with Chief Paul Dean to try and give you a sense of what are the things that we've done to try and help us prepare for and to avoid an event like that. So the first thing I'll mention is that we have and we make regular use of an emergency notification system. So we have the ability to reach out to everyone on all of our various campuses uh, instantly. Uh, we also do consistently drills within the police department, but also more broadly, including university leaders, of what we would do in a situation like the one that presented itself, <clears throat> excuse me, at Michigan State. Uh, I'm very proud to say that our police department has the highest level of accreditation that's possible for a university police department, which means that they have been trained in all of the things that they need to know to be able to operate in a challenging situation like the ones that we're talking about. Fourth, I'll say that we're in touch with law enforcement. We are, we are not an island. I mean, law enforcement is really a network. And we, with leadership from Chief Dean, are in touch with law enforcement both regionally and nationally, which helps us to anticipate and diffuse threats before they actually happen. And this isn't theoretical. Uh, you've probably read about this in the newspaper that we had a situation uh, at UNH Manchester last year, which could have resulted in considerable loss of life. But because of the things that I've just gotten finished talked about, we were able to avoid that and to resolve that solution very quickly. And finally, I'll mention that our police chief, Paul Dean, is the president-elect of the International Association of Campus Law Enforcement Administrators and also is heading the state's education school safety task force. So there's no guarantees. You know, you know that. We live, in, we live in a dangerous world. But I think that we are doing just about everything we could possibly do to try and protect the campus. And I actually want to, he's here, and I would just like to take one second to show our appreciation for the leadership of Chief Dean around campus safety. Thanks, Chief, and any rumors of nepotism based on our names, not, nothing for any of that. I do have uh, prepared answers to some of the questions that have been submitted online, but I thought I would take a couple of minutes and see if anyone in the audience uh, would like to step up to the mic and, and ask questions. And if you decide to do that you know, a little bit later while I'm answering the online questions, I'm happy to do that too. Those chairs are comfortable, I know. I hate to get out. Okay, so, and, and again, feel free as, as I go through some of the other questions. Uh, a number of questions were submitted around access and affordability. Uh, one of the questions was whether the granite guarantee would be extended to students whose family income is greater than the Pell Grant uh, eligibility, and what are we doing to support students financially. Uh, also, someone acknowledged that we have one of the highest in-state tuition rates in the country, what's being done to make our public university more affordable for New Hampshire residents. So I mentioned some of this along the way, but, but it probably bears repeating. Roughly 2,000 New Hampshire students receive the Granite Guarantee, 2,000 students. Um, most Pell eligible families earn less than $35,000 a year. So that's, that's the echelon that we're talking about. And I'm very proud to say that we're offering this for the fifth consecutive year. We know that, of course, other families face uh, extraordinary need. Over the past five years, the total number of New Hampshire students who receive financial aid has written by, risen by 55%, and the total dollar amount we have awarded has increased 50% the last five years. 80%, excuse me, 88% of first-time UNH students receive aid and or scholarship support. The average scholarship is just over $12,000. And since you asked, a great way to help our students is coming in April with the 603 challenge. 
This invites people to contribute support at any amount to the colleges and programs of their choice. And it's because of philanthropy that we've been able to do the things that we've done and the great support we've gotten from our alumni and from our friends around the state and around the country. Last year, we had over 12,000 donors contributed to the 603 Challenge, raising a total of more than $3 million for 62 programs. So I, I think it's fair to say that we take the financial needs of our students very seriously uh, across the university. And I'm really proud to be able to say what I've just said about that support. That comes from programs that were here long before me, so I'm not trying to take any credit for it. But I'm just really delighted that we've been able to make it possible for these students to attend UNH. And I know the story that's out there is how expensive we are, but let's also share the story of everything we do to make it more affordable for students to be able to come to UNH. With apologies to those of you who have heard me say this many, many times before, uh, a friend of mine wrote a book a few years ago, and the epigram for the book was that talent is universal, but opportunity is not. And when we, UNH, are at our best, what we're doing is bringing opportunity to talented young people and allowing them to flourish. And if you look at the alumni who have graduated from here over the, the decades, they've gone on to do extraordinary things. We're very proud of them, but it started here. It started with your commitment to them. So again, lots and lots to be proud of there. Okay, so you guys knew all about Peaches. I'm about to find out if you know a lot about the Board of Trustees. <laughs> How do you like them apples? <laughs> so the question was, how are members of the USNH Board of Trustees selected? Such a great straight line, but I'm not going to take it. Are there term limits? What is the diversity of the BOT? Are appointments politi politically motivated to assist our efforts in the State House? So uh, USNH, so for those of you who are not close to this, uh, the Board of Trustees is actually for the whole university system, including UNH, Keene, and, and Plymouth, and now, of course, Granite State is part of us. 28 members of the Board of Trustees, including the Governor, a member of the State Senate, a member of the House, 10 members appointed by the Governor and the Executive Council, seven alumni elected members, I believe four of those are from UNH, two student elected members, and then two commissioners, the Commissioner of Education and the Commissioner of Agriculture, back to our history, right? Uh, the presidents of UNH's colleges and universities, and the Chancellor which right now is me, the Chief Executive Officer of the University System. Trustees serve a four-year term and can serve no more than two terms. Uh, in selecting officers, USNH bylaws require the nominating committee to consider the skills, experience, interests, aspirations, and recommendations for each board member. And you can go online and with the obvious Google search and you can find who are the members of the, of the Board of Trustees, um, those that come from UNH and those that come from elsewhere. Uh, this isn't written in my answer, but someone asked about uh, diversity. I would say we're doing reasonably well on diversity from a male-female standpoint. Not so great on a racial standpoint, but we took this as a challenge in the last time that we had a member open up from UNH, and we have now done our bit to begin to increase the diversity of the board. Lots more needs to be done, but we've, we've taken the first step. Uh, third question, what are the initiatives or actions the university is taking to combat racism? Um, there's a lot to say about this, and most of what I'm going to say is go to the right websites and you'll find some amazing things. Uh, there's a number of new and expanded efforts in this area. Um, the best place to follow them is on the diversity, uh, equity, access, and inclusion website. Uh, another great source is Division of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion annual report, which was just published last summer, so it's not really out of date. Uh, as you know, this is Black History Month, and we're hosting more than 20 events and promoting additional programs with our partners across the state. So two that are coming up, February 17th, Cultivating Community, which comes from the Paul College Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Conference, uh, which will connect students, staff, faculty, alumni, business leaders, and interested members of the local community in workshops and panels. And on February 21st, the Shadows Fall North panel discussion will highlight stories of Africans and African Americans in New Hampshire from slavery to the civil rights era. And this is made possible by a partnership between alumni relations and the Office of Community Equity and Diversity. Uh, there's an awful lot of other programs that are at the college level or the departmental level. And I'm, I'm really proud that the momentum around diversity and 
addressing oppression and racism has really continued at this university. It wasn't just an episode back a few years ago. Um, and there's, if you go to these websites, you'll find a, a tremendous amount of programming and, and offering. Uh, the office, here's one that I really want to make sure to mention. Uh, the Office of the Provost continues to fund the postdoctoral diversity and innovation scholars, which helps attract qualified, diverse postdoctoral students to the UNH professoriate. And it's noteworthy to mention here that 100% of the participants in this program have been hired in tenure track positions, and 50% of them have chosen to join us here at UNH. That would not have happened without that program. So congrats to Wayne and his team and, and all the deans who have, have made that happen. Um, maybe two other uh, quick things. One is we had actually in this room yesterday, I don't know how many of you made it, but there was a wonderful presentation yesterday uh, of a museum of African American history with all sorts of artifacts that have come throughout history from back in the pre-Civil War era all the way up to the present. And if you follow me on Instagram, I was here and I took some photos, so you can, you can take a look at that. And then also, uh, many of you know that I read a lot and I send out notes about what books I've been reading. And I've been reading uh, this incredible book that I would highly recommend to you um, for Black History Month. And it's called Master, Slave, Husband, Wife, which is an odd title, I'll give you that. And it's about a woman who is enslaved in Georgia around 1850 or 1852, who was uh, in the parlance of the time light enough to pass as a white person. And so she disguised herself not just as a white person, but as a white man, and went with her husband, who was black and was also enslaved, from Georgia to the north to escape slavery. It's a true story. It's, you wouldn't think it could possibly be true, but it is. Um, so I recommend that book. If, if you read my note this month, you'll, you'll be able to see it. Um, but I'm also trying to get, I was so struck by it, I'm trying to get the author of the book to do a talk for us here um, via Zoom. It makes it a lot easier to do it via Zoom than actually get her here. Uh, but I would certainly encourage you to read that if, if you have any interest in that. I think I will just stop there. Um, are there, I'll give you another, another shot. Anyone in the audience from any of that? Yes, sir. Hi. Step right up. My name is Brett Kinsey. I'm the Associate Dean Hi. for Research. You were up there. I was up there. I saw you just a minute I know. ago. How'd you I, get? It's, oh. <laughs> it's always uncomfortable to see myself on the screen and talk. Yeah, tell me about it. <laughs> so it's, yeah, so I'm being brave getting up right now. So, so my question is about the EDGE project, which I'm very excited about. Mm -hmm. I was hoping you could give some status update on that, milestones. What's next for that project to go forward? Sure. Uh, thank you for that question, Brad. I appreciate it. So we're, we're in the planning stage for it now. We've, you know, I think this has been probably since before I was here an on-again, off-again thing. Maybe we're going to do it, maybe we're not. I think, I think it's fair to say, and you can probably say this about a number of things, we were maintaining a lot of great momentum and then COVID hit and we just stopped for two years or something like that. So we're looking at it again now. The main thing that we're working on now is that we want to do this, but the university itself has limited funds, shocker, right, to be able to do this. So we are about to go through, I'm gonna look for Marianne and tell me when I go off the track here. We're looking to work with a consulting firm to help us figure out how to do this by virtue of a public-private partnership so that it would not mean a huge outflow of money from us. Um, Marion tells me that we have a lot of interest in the corporate community of people who would like to co-locate here and what we need to do is to figure out what the source of funding can be. Um, by virtue of a grant that we believe we're going to get, we believe we will have some money, so it's, we will have some capital to be able to put forward to this, but we'd love to do it in conjunction with the business community. So that will be the next thing that'll happen, and that part is in process now, right? Trying to get the RFP done. So once we get that, we'll have our, our consultants, and I've been exposed to some of them. There's a lot of smart people out there who can help us figure out how to do this, and um, we'll keep you posted. I think it would be a great addition. I was pretty excited every time I see that video. Great. Other questions for today? Again, I, I can't thank you enough for coming. I can't thank you enough for all of your wonderful contributions to the university. This is a great institution and I'm very proud to be part of it. I hope you are as well. Have a great day.